name's Caroline Horton. I mainly work in theatre as a writer and performer, creating my own work in collaboration with small creative teams. Um, the work's usually funny, it's quite often dark, it's often political and really often it's also personal. Um, pieces I've made include You're Not Like the Other Girls Chrissy. This was based on my French grandmother's love story with my English grandfather in World War II. Um, there's Mess. This is an ensemble show and it's based on my own experiences of anorexia and recovery. And then most recently, All of Me, um, a solo show about depression and capitalism and keeping on, keeping on. Um, again, drawn from personal experience. Um, I mean, other work that's not so clearly biographical or autobiographical still always draws really deeply from personal stories. In 2013, in addition to theatre work, I also started working in radio. Um, this was mainly for the BBC creating standalone audio dramas and again, often drawing on and adapting personal experience um, or experience of other people close to me. Um, but I also contribute various episodes to radio series. What else? Um, increasingly, I do a lot of mentoring and directing dramaturging work on other people's pieces of work as well. And if you're curious, you can find out more about me on my website, carolinehorton.net. Well, first I work out what I want to write about. Um, I look for what I love, what makes me angry, what do I care about at the moment? Is anything obsessing me in some way? Maybe it's an issue like stigma around mental health or everyday racism. Otherwise, maybe, um, maybe there's a person that um, I love listening to. Um, maybe it's your grandfather's stories or... Or again, maybe it's a particular world that fascinates you. Um, something like the world around horse racing or your local amateur, amateur dramatic club or the kind of life and characters around a support group. And then at that point, <clears throat> once I've worked out what it is I think I want to write about, I start researching and depending on the subject I will read, I'll watch relevant seeming documentaries and films, ask questions of people with aligned experiences or perhaps even experts in, in the field. I might conduct interviews with the people involved especially if it's biographical material that I'm dealing with. And I kind of saturate myself in it all, um, allowing my interest and the complexity of my ideas to grow bit by bit. Then alongside this, I'll start gently considering these questions. So, why do I want to tell this story? Why should I be the one to tell it? And why should I tell this story now? Um, alongside these questions and my research, I'm going to also be thinking about um, how I want to tell this story. So does it feel right that it's an audio piece rather than, I don't know, a series of poems or a play or, or something else? Um, what am I interested in doing with this piece stylistically? So, for example, do I want the audio piece to have a particularly kind of documentary feel? Um, or am I interested in playing with hearing a character's internal voice? Um, does silence feel particularly important and like something I want to play around with? Um, and do I have any ideas around music and sound design? Moving on from that, another big question I always ask myself um, and keep asking myself as I approach a new project is what experience do I want the audience to have? Um, do I want them to leave deeply moved? Um, maybe I want them to grow their understanding around a particular issue. Do I want to challenge them? Um, do I also want to make them laugh? Um, do I want to help them appreciate the small things, etc, etc. Um, so that's a little bit about how I'd begin. 
And um, I'd also say don't worry about having the answers to these questions locked down. Um, your thoughts are going to shift and evolve and deepen over time, but I find these are important questions to consider along the way. Um, when I was at drama school in Paris, the teacher, um, Philippe Gollier, said as he looked around the room at his 20 or so students, that there were so many beautiful and extraordinary stories right here that no one should ever need to do another adaptation of War and Peace. I have nothing against adaptations, actually, um, but I also think he's right and that every one of us has characters and stories within us and around us that could make really incredible bits of art. Um, it also means that you're going to be offering something truly unique as well. Saying that, I think it's always really valuable to put some distance between real events and the dramatised version. I mean, this, this can be done in lots of ways. It might be through the heightened style of the piece. Um, it might be by just changing the names or the places or the details. It might also involve weaving other fictional stories or other strands through the biographical and autobiographical elements. Even in pieces that I've made that are openly autobiographical, it's never like a diary entry. The original material will have been reworked, transformed, converted into something whole and new. And this distance really allows me to take more liberties and be more playful. Um, just a thing to add, if your piece recognisably involves other people, not just you, um, it's important to remember to have conversations with those people, um, ensure they understand what you're writing about, that they feel comfortable enough with that. Um, and my experience has been that if people feel communicated with, if they feel you're being open, and if they, if they really understand why you think this story is of value, they're usually on side and really ready to help. Um, another side note, um, just in terms of thinking about safeguarding and well-being, both of your audiences and of yourself, if you're dealing with um, potentially painful stories or issues, you know, is there support in place to look after yourself and others? I've often worked with an artist well-being practitioner to support a creative team and myself um, and we put little things in place like a check-in and check-out with the team at the start and the end of a work session. I mean I'm wondering if there's a version of that that you could set up for yourself perhaps with a writing buddy or a friend just to keep an eye on how you're doing if the material you're looking at is potentially triggering. And then in terms of audience care, before the piece is broadcast, might it be responsible to mention the potentially triggering subject matter? Um, and then at the end, to signpost audiences to sources of support and further information. So you've done your research and you feel like you're more or less ready to go. Um, so I thought I'd just share a few techniques that I find useful. Um, I think it's important to say that everyone is different. Some of these are going to work for you and others will leave you cold. And I think it's important to listen to those instincts. Writing isn't like jobs where you need to sit at your desk from nine to five and work through some clear tasks. Um, you'll gradually develop a personal toolkit of things that help. Um, going for a long walk might be much more helpful at certain points of the process than staying tied to your desk, staring at your computer screen, hoping that inspiration is going to strike. Um, so I think it's about being playful um, within the work. Um, so first off, I thought I'd talk a bit about storyboarding. Um, so something I find really useful is on small bits of paper to write down moments that you know you want to happen in your piece. Um, they might not feel complete yet, but um, if you trust those instincts that you know you want them in there, they'll gradually build into scenes as your thinking develops. And then you can put those pieces of paper, those moments that you're developing, in an order that you think they might go in. 
Um, you can then change the order, move those papers around, play about, um, and also start to recognise um, if there are any repetitions in there. You know, just some moments do the same job as other moments. I find this moment as well in the process really useful to look out for flavours that might be missing in your piece. You know, is there enough range and variety here? Are quieter moments mixed with moments of conflict or surprise, um, moments of joy or excitement? Just thinking about how is the balance of your piece feeling? Is the audience going to get that experience that you want them to get? Something that also helps me to keep the story moving is to check whether within each of your scenes that there's a movement from a positive to a negative or a negative to a positive. Um, in each of these moments and, and scenes, something needs to have changed. Um, and this might be an emotional change. It, it isn't necessarily a plot event. But if there isn't that change, I think it's important to question if it really belongs in the structure. Here are some exercises I find helpful generally and especially helpful if I've got myself stuck or I'm a bit bored. So number one, I try and take myself, the writer, out of the picture and allow one of my characters to decide what happens next. Maybe even letting them write the scene and see if that offers me kind of fresh perspective. Um, number two, automatic writing. I'm sure you've heard about versions of this. Um, I find it really useful. So without taking your pen off the page, write for two or three minutes, you could time yourself and do this without thinking or stopping. And it could be about a character what they like, what they hate, what they look like. Um, it could be about a setting that's involved in your piece. Um, it could be about the character's thoughts on an event that takes place. What this fast writing does for me is turn off my inner critic, my inner editor, and allows me just to create for a bit. The editor's going to be needed later, but sometimes they just get in the way. A third idea um, I use music and soundscapes. I think it's important to remember um, that you're writing for audio. Um, I quite enjoy creating, even if it's in a rough kind of DIY way, the sounds and atmospheres of a scene and then writing with those sounds playing as I write. Um, I simply do this picking them off something like YouTube um, and I might pick music that feels like it offers the kind of right atmosphere for a particular moment. Um, or perhaps I go the other way. Maybe there's a track that feels playful in, and is a big contrast to the scene that I'm writing. These soundscapes also help me quieten down my critical inner voice. And again, just get on with the writing. Um, and a fourth one. If you set yourself a task that plays with form, um, so if a scene is feeling flat or boring, um, you might give yourself a restriction, um, something like only use sentences of three words, or having to begin a new line of dialogue with the same letter that the last line ended with. In a way, these are arbitrary games, but often I find that the material they produce is more inventive, surprising, creative and less ordinary. And then just a general thought about your first draft. As far as you can, write without your inner editor. Allow it to be rubbish. Allow it to be chaotic and overwritten and too long with gaps in it. And just trust that it's part of the process. Um, then once you've got it out, you can redraft and reshape. Um, and at the point you feel ready to, um, I would really recommend reading it aloud to someone. You will get so much information from doing this. Um, it, it'll give you information about bits you want to cut. You'll notice where you were bored, etc. In my experience at this early stage, um, your own realisations are, are probably going to be more important than sort of seeking feedback from, from whoever you've, you've gotten to read it to. Um, 
as you redraft as well, um, think about cuts. Um, I find it really useful to sort of look at what could I possibly lose, really looking to cut out anything that doesn't need to be said. Um, I guess it's remembering that so much exists between the lines of text um, will be implied by actors in delivery and I know that as an audience member I love to join the dots myself rather than having everything explained to me. When you've redrafted again, read it aloud to someone again. Um, I, I can't stress how useful I find that part of the process though it can be a bit unnerving. <laughs> Um, and yeah, this process could probably go on and on, redrafting, reading it, redrafting, um, and that's why we all need deadlines. Producing company Fuel, who usually work in theatre, um, they've got a lovely series of podcasts called While We Wait. I've got one nestled in there somewhere um, about waiting to come home. Um, a couple of BBC series that I've worked on that are available online, um, one called Tracks and one called Homefront. Um, and there's, of course, such an incredible array of amazing podcast material now, some that really crosses that boundary between documentary, investigation and drama, which I think are really exciting. Um, a couple of... Um, podcasts that I think are really beautifully structured that I've really enjoyed listening to recently are Someone Knows Something, um, that's kind of in the true crime genre, um, and then Catch and Kill. Um, and finally, um, just to share a book on writing that I found really helpful and I often go back to um, Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg. Um, it's got some really helpful exercises for whatever form your writing was to take. Um, yeah, that's it from me. Uh, I wish you all the best with your writing and thanks for watching. <laughs>